Hey folks, and welcome back. Now, if you're new here, my name is Daniel, and today I'm going to be walking you through how to make this awesome set of modular city walls. They're pretty cool. I really like how they turned out. This video did take a little longer to put out than I wanted it to, but in completely unrelated news, did you, uh, did you guys know Baldur's Gate 3 is out? Yeah. I'm going to start by cutting some foam for the walls. I made these about 2.75 inches high so that once I add the top and bottom pieces, they'll be slightly shorter than 3 inches. That way I can make the columns a flat 3 so that they'll all connect nicely. That's also the height I use for a single floor of my custom buildings, so it lines up well that way too. I also cut a few of the walls to be random sizes so that I can have different size sections. That's not totally necessary, but it does help make them more dynamic. With the main sections of wall cut, it's time for texture. I'm going to use a texture roller, but first I like to go over it with the old tinfoil ball method. If you want a simpler stone texture for your walls, you could honestly just leave it there and have a nice, simple craft. But I want these walls to fit the aesthetic of my city, to look handmade and even kind of old and broken down, like they've been patched up and repaired multiple times over the years. So that's what I'm going to shoot for. Once they all have the tinfoil texture, I move on to a 3D printed texture roller. Now, if you don't have one of those, you can always use the tried and true method of drawing on bricks or stones and going over them with a knife or pen. If you want to see how to do that, check out my dungeon tiles video. I use that technique there. It's super simple. On these big projects though, speed is important, so I go with the roller. I've decided I want one of the city walls to feature a window too. I'm always looking to add visual variety and new gameplay elements in the terrain when I can, so I just pick a circle that's about the right size and trace the shape onto one of my walls. I cut it out with a hot wire, though a knife is fine as long as you're careful and using a sharp blade. A dull blade is likely going to tear the foam. And finally, I cut the wall in two lengthwise. It'll get put back together later on. With that done, it's time to paint. Everything gets a coat of black Mod Podge, though whether or not that's a good idea is going to depend on what kind of color scheme you're going with. Personally, I want a warm undertone to everything, so I follow the black up with a thin layer of yellow, just to give a warm color to base everything that comes later. But don't worry, it's, it's not going to stay patchy bumblebee yellow for very long. Once that's all dry, I pick out some craft paints and some miniature paints that I don't use much and I just start painting in bricks. I want to stick with warm, interesting tones, so while I mostly go with browns, I make sure to choose browns that lean to different colors, mostly orange, pink, and yellow. A stone can be just about any color you like though. Now if you're doing this yourself and it looks too bright to you at this stage, don't worry too much. Once you dry brush it and wash it, these colors will start to fall in line with each other and look like they go naturally together. So I start with one color and add more and more and more. All right, all right. Now, if you're looking at this and thinking it would have been way easier to do this the other way. Yeah, absolutely, you're right. Um, the problem is, I thought that I was gonna paint every brick individually, that was the original plan. Which is something I've done before, but on a project of this scale, that proved to be pretty insurmountable. It was just too much, so I changed the plan partway through. But I do recommend that you do it the other way if you're doing this yourself. Especially if you're doing a paint job that's this complicated, then what you want to do is base coat everything in a color you're happy with first, and then obviously pick out the colors of bricks that you want. But this, this wasn't too bad. It didn't take forever or anything.
I was just rolling deception on myself. Having rolled a 17 and successfully lied to myself about how well this is going, I move on to a wash. I'm using an oil wash that's a mix of yellow ochre and burnt umber to reinforce all of those warm yellow tones while still bringing in some darker shadows. An acrylic wash would be fine here, of course, if that's what you're comfortable with or have on hand or fits your aesthetic, though I do recommend trying out oils if you get the chance. Once that's dried, I grab an off-white paint and just dry brush everything. This is going to help pick out details, but also to add more contrast between the highest, brightest points and the deepest, most recessed points of the texture. Lately, I've also taken to adding more visual noise to my stone walls and floors. I do that by diluting paints down to a glaze consistency so that they're almost completely transparent and just spattering them randomly on the stones. Today I'm using white and burnt umber for that. If you're going to do this technique, do make sure you're not also splattering the walls of your crafting space or your table or any other projects you have laying around. It uh, travels further than you would think, trust me. With the basics of my paint job done, it's time to add the window to my, well, window wall. I'm using a sheet of clear plastic for this, I just cut a small piece and sandwich it between the two walls, glue it, and reassemble it back into a single wall. No problem. For the final step, I take some cheap air dry clay, a tub of water, and a kitchen sponge. I just kind of dive in, get messy, and smear this all over the walls, keeping it very, very wet. Once the whole wall is covered, I take the kitchen sponge and wipe off everything that's on the surface or that you don't like the look of. After that, I stipple the sponge over the entire wall to give it a stonier texture and so that you can't see any lines where I've wiped with the sponge. Now, last time I did something like this, I think a few people got upset that I wasn't using spackle or polyfilla or premixed grout. So I want to be clear, those are all great options for doing this kind of thing, and if they're what you have on hand, they will work perfectly for this. Now this Crayola air dry clay that I'm using was purchased on sale. It was about four or five dollars for this entire huge tub of it, and I bought two. So I honestly have more of it than I'll use in my entire lifetime. So for me, that makes it the ideal option. While all that clay dries, it is time to move on. I still need tops and bottoms for the walls as well as to craft the columns. I decided to make the final footprint of the walls an inch wide so that they would be easy to use on a gridded board or play area if I ever need to. It just keeps it simpler. The columns are three inches tall and one and a half inches squared since, oh, well, that's, that's the size of foam I have laying around. Sometimes it really is just about simplicity. I use the hot wire tool to put a little decoration on the columns too. Just something simple. These kinds of large blank slates are great places to express some character. A simple geometric design could, for instance, make the walls look dwarven, or you could attach some beads or gems to change the character of the build. You could even add statues on top of the columns, or plants, or whatever works for your campaign and setting. Just like before, all of these pieces get hit with the tinfoil ball for texture. Make sure to get those sharp corners and round them down a little too. Then I added some cracks and took out some chunks to add some weathering. After that, it's a base coat of burnt umber, and then some successively lighter dry brushes. I start with a pretty hard overbrush of burnt sienna, a regular dry brush of territorial beige, and then a very light dry brush of off-white. And finally, it's time for assembly. 
Again, speed is important for big projects like this, at least for me. So I'm going with hot glue. As long as it's set at a low temperature, you don't really have to worry about it melting your foam. There's nothing really tricky about this part. The tops of the walls go on top, the bottoms go on the bottom, and then on to the next piece. And when it's assembled, I end up with a finished product that looks like this. So I'm super happy with how these turned out. I think they look great. And they're gonna stand out not just on the board for my Roman city, but on any other board, they're gonna look great too. They, these could easily be transferred to any other type of fantasy city. They could be anywhere in Faerun or anywhere else you might play. And on top of that, because of how modular they are, it would be incredibly simple to just add more pieces to this and build it out further. You could add guard towers or city gates. You could even add sections of rubble and ruin to make things more tactically interesting or change the character of your city. Ultimately, I'm really happy with how these look and I'm happy with the modularity of them. I think there's gonna be a lot of uses for them in my next campaign and just in general on the tabletop. All right, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit like, hit subscribe, leave comments, all that fun stuff. In fact, if you've made it this far through the video, what I'd like you to do is leave a comment telling me what your favorite D&D monster is or a D&D monster that you rarely see painted and used on the tabletop. I want to do some more 3D printing of monsters and painting of them on the channel. I think that's a great way to start. Alright, uh, if you want to support the channel, there are links to buymeacoffee.com and to an Amazon wishlist below. And other than that, thanks for watching. There's more on the way. I'll see you on the next one.